it's, it's quite a mystery in that it's inexplainable. It's a story that's going to keep on giving because people believe in it. Search for Brady Murphy, you know, was among the first of the paranormal research books that, that, that hit the popular shelves and became bestsellers. I read it as a kid, I remember. Reincarnation then had a very short life. In fact, when Jesse Stern was approached by someone from Canada, Jesse Stern is an American, with the story of Joanne McIver and her reincarnation to the 19th century, he almost decided not to do anything with the story because he felt reincarnation was overdone, overused, and possibly not in his bailiwick. And it did have a short life therefore after. So this kind of story of another life dreamed uh, is fairly rare. And nowhere as near documented as Stern's book. It's a 300 pager, really closely detailed. When we first moved up here from Toronto, and uh, we got a cottage up in Meaford on the water up here. And uh, I just started hearing different things about this. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I found the book. Living in North Sydenham Township, I sort of had an immediate identification with Joanne McIver's 14-year-old um, under hypnosis recollections of growing up in basically what is North Grey uh, and North St. Vincent Townships in the 1840s. Her father, Ken McIver, was doing some uh, hypnotizing of her friends in the kitchen. And I believe she was in the living room. And she went under. This is where it uh, became a little strange. Some of her um, trips back into time were as famous people in Roman times and so forth. But then she gets stranded at a moment in the hypnotic moments which she records in Northern Gray County as a woman who lived on a farm, a pioneer farm, and at one time was abused by um, one of the farmhands. And who, she then has memories of growing up in subsequent, in subsequent interviews of growing up and eventually dying and um, just at the turn of the 20th century. The way that I believe uh, in my life uh, and, and with what I do, because I'm an intuitive medium, I believe in people that have passed away, I believe that they can contact us. So let's use this, that Susan Gagne has passed, but she wants her story told. And then through this hypnotizing that Ken McIver is doing, Joanne McIver uh, goes under and starts. So Joanne McIver is actually telling, telling Susan Gagne's story. And when I read the book, I kept thinking, this is really close to home. You know, this is close to where I live because I would run into page after page, uh, descriptions of families, descriptions of family names. Um, the Speedy family, for example, play a role in her memories in the 1850s. At that time, the Speedies were the uh, ran a um, general store in, in um, Annan, Ontario. There is a headstone in the cemetery, the Annan Cemetery, of Margaret Speedy's. And that goes along with when I first came up here and I started my research, I believe it was a real estate gentleman got me the topographical maps of the area. And I took the book and I did the names and quite a few of the names went with the tank range and all the places that she had been. Two small villages, one called Silcote and the other called Balaclava. Have a, have a role in the book and at one point she even remembers that she grew up near the mountain and the mountain was once the name of the post office in Silco before it changed its name to Silco. And the, the twin churches in uh, Massey and I mean where did she come up with these stories? I mean the, the, the story, the book that I have over here on Meaford wasn't even out then, you know, on the whole area. After I read the book I got really curious about the whole story. And it sort of lingered in my mind. And I remember one time when the tank range, as we called it then, was less guarded as it 
is today. And the fences, in fact, were down just north of Balaclava, and I went on the tank range and did a, a small motorcycle tour looking for Massey, looking for graves, looking for the places that are the place names that are very much part of Joey McIver's memory of growing up in this frontier um, of, of, of Gray County. It could be an extravagant hoax. Joey McIver tells the story in Aurelia. Aurelia is about a two and a half hour drive from here. And um, today, in modern, but in distance at the time when uh, Joanne is trying to recall 19th century. They could have been a century apart, you know, a thousand kilometers between Aurelia and this frontier. So my question has always been is how in the world did the Joanne or his her father discover the detail about some place so far away? You didn't get into your car back then and drive all the way up to the army base up here or even to Meaford. Collingwood, you know, to do something that is going to be a scam. You know, like back then, you just didn't do that. It wasn't a day drive. It really wasn't. It's, it's almost impossible because there wouldn't have been that many documents at that time that would have been available to, to MacIver, um, certainly not to Joanne. She's a 14-year-old kid. Uh, there weren't that many documents. Um, there was a gazetteer in the county for 1880. Uh, if he used that, it would be a very strange way to deal with it. But... Um, that's the mystery to me, is the huge jump from Aurelia to North Gray by a 14-year-old girl who is remembering people's names, family names, place names, concession lines, descriptions of, 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 old, uh, of old trees and orchards that many people say, well, that was just over here, or that was just over there. If this was a hoax, why would they possible hoaxers pick someone so obscure without the documentation to prove their case. Most hoaxers of this type would at least try to ensure they had all their ducks in a row with at least some of the necessary documents to support their case. I think there's nothing more mysterious than how this young 14 year old could possibly, even if her father had done some research with uh, gazetteers, how she could have possibly have remembered the plethora of names and places and events and times and dates and descriptions of life on the frontier of what is today apple country basically of the daily lives of being a farm woman. Nobody has disproved it. I mean and how can you now but nobody has disproved this like you can't you can't say, well, she made up the names or she just, she guessed at the name. No, she didn't. Those names and they're there are real names. They are real people. There's not been a re-examination of the families, the places, and the events that she describes. No one's ever really took a close look at the local newspapers at that time, particularly the New Meaver newspapers, to see if some of the events that Susan Joanne remembers were actual events or not. And the book has been left to sort of drift, you know, which is, which is fine because not many people really remember this book or the mystery of the girl with the blue eyes. But oddly enough, it keeps reoccurring. I've had people even tell me that they remember where she died. It was in an old house just off the tank range just down from the apiary that I think that you visited is legendarily the place that um, Susan Garnier would have died according to Joanne McIver and I think about 1903. These simple shards, these artifacts are, are, are basically the story of Susan Garnier as told to us by Joanne McIver. It's a story made up of pieces and shards, and they can't all be put together to really create anything until someone, uh, some historical archeologist, finally decides to put all those pieces together and come up with a true story of Susan Garnier, as remembered by Joanne McIver.